Although we rarely celebrate the work of the Grim Reaper, we will happily make an exception for the Mini Paceman. While the first generation of the Countryman crossover sold in sufficient volume to warrant development of the successor we are driving here, it's ungainly, ugly, two-door Suda Coupe sister found more ridiculous than buyers. Mini confirms that it won't be making another Paceman, and for that we are genuinely grateful. We'd suggest burying it in a garlic-filled coffin with a stake through its heart. The Paceman's demise makes this new Countryman the priciest Mini, performance specials aside with its range at cherrying purpose backed by a serious expansion in size. The first Countryman was big when compared with the Bijou Mini hardtop of the day, but it was overly compact even by compact crossover standards. Owners and potential buyers told Mini's customer clinicians they wanted it to be bigger and more practical. Which seems like a strange thing to hear from people in the market for a car named Mini but it also explains why the new 2017 Countryman has grown by a significant 8.5 inches in length and 2.9 inches in wheelbase. Yet the expansion isn't immediately obvious when you look at it, the proportions being almost identical to the old cars. With the exception of the added length of the rearmost side window, this second generation Countryman looks as if it was styled with a photocopier's scale conversion. The new Countryman retains the plastic wheelage cladding that automotive designers use as visual shorthand for malgrade SUVs, its modest ground clearance precludes anything but the most gentle off-road use. Under the surface, though, much changes. This Countryman follows the rest of the Mini clan by switching to BMW's new front-wheel drive architecture, specifically the Acker 2 platform that also underpins the BMW X1 which is this Mini's more straight-laced cousin. The engine lineup won't burden US buyers since only two, both shared with other Minis, will be available initially. The intralevel Cooper employs a turbocharged 1.5-litre three-cylinder producing 134 horsepower while the Cooper S brings a 189 horsepower turbocharged 2.0-litre four, which is basically the smaller engine with another cylinder. Europe gets diesel options including a three-cylinder, but there are no plans to bring these to America. A Braunia 228 horsepower John Cooper Works version will follow close behind, with a Plugin Hybrid Cooper SC later in the year. Front drive is standard, but part-time all four all wheel drive is optional on both Cooper and S trims, as is a six or eight-speed automatic in place of the standard six-speed manual. We'd love to be able to give you the comprehensive lowdown on all of these powertrains, but the only car we got to drive on the launch in England was a fully loaded Cooper S all four equipped with the 8-speed automatic. Familiar outside, different within, the cabin is more spacious and less gloomy than its predecessors, with better fit and finish and genuine evidence of ergonomic planning, which is new for many. As in the current hardtop, there are still some hard to see low mounted toggle switches, apparently riffing on the original 1959 BMC Mini, and a fair bit of different for the sake of being different design. The rounded navigation screen, trimmed to fit in a circular central binnacle, is a styling cue that we suspect a middle-aged designer thought would appeal to millennials. Practical considerations get their due, though, with generous space both front and rear. The driving position is raised, as you'd expect for a crossover. It's not quite as you've commanding but is certainly assertive. There's also adult viable room in the back with wear at headspace and a respectable 18 cubic feet of luggage volume beneath the hatch with the seats in place and 48 cubes with them stowed. It drives as you'd expect, like a big, fat mini with extra ride height. Yet it also moves with considerably more dynamic polish than its predecessor. The first countryman rode rough roads as if it were being frog marched down a pier in concrete boots, but this one copes far better with undulating surfaces, even on the Cooper S's standard 18-inch aluminium wheels. It's still firm, but there's a new fauna compliance that helps it ride out moderate bumps without being thrown off course. BMW's chassis engineers never seem to tire of go-kart handling in the How To Tune Your Mini playbook. The new Countryman's right no steering response doesn't really suit the rest of its crossover character. Like a hot hatch, it dives for apexes with the slightest of steering inputs. But beyond this initial enthusiasm, 
there's little of the involvement or adjustability that the smaller minis manage, the driven rear axle still unable to supply much help as the front end runs wide on tight or greasy corners. It handles faster turns with more aplomb, feeling impressively stable and planted. But it's also loud at cruising velocity, allowing a surprising amount of road roar and wind noise into the cabin. The 2.0-litre engine isn't short on poke, but its efforts are blunted by the Cooper S's curb weight, which Mini claims is 3,671 pounds Our scales usually measure higher weights than Mini's. We suspect that the three-cylinder Cooper is going to feel pretty leisurely. The bigger engine's strong mid-range torque and some intelligent shifting from the 8-speed automatic make the S feel brisk most of the time, but pushing harder reveals the engine's lack of lungs at higher revs. Anybody in search of a genuinely rapid countryman will have to wait a month and pay several grand more for the John Cooper Works version. Densely packaged, with reasonable prices and an ample list of standard features, including a panoramic glass sunroof and leatherette upholstery, the countryman will probably sell well. It will be more deserving of its success than its lackluster predecessor, which accounted for a quarter of Mini's US sales last year and despite its flaws. The countryman remains a confused car, a pudgy wannabe athlete that is struggling to bridge the streams of crossover and performance hatchback. But it's likable enough on its own terms and bigger than before, and for many potential buyers it will probably suffice.